Last week we began a study dealing with the Holy Spirit, realizing the great confusion in the world today, and even in the church regarding the Spirit. Uh, yet the Bible, as we start uh, going through this, has a great deal to say about Him. As we looked last week, we started looking at the question, who He is. And you cannot help but notice in the Scriptures that the Spirit is always a masculine personality. He uses personal pronouns that are masculine in gender and singular in number. And so we start seeing or noticing that He is a person. And we noted that he has personal actions. He speaks, he guides, he leads and forbids, he searches, he comforts, and he intercedes for us. He also has personal traits. He has a mind, he has affections, he has a will, or the power of volition or choice, he has a trait of goodness and we can have fellowship with him. And he also suffers slights and injuries. He can be grieved and vexed. He can be despised. He can be blasphemed. He can be resisted, lied to. And yes, we can, or it was possible to quench the Spirit. So this afternoon, we want to look a little bit farther just to say he's, there is a personality that is the Spirit, we also need to recognize his divinity. He is God. He has all of the traits and prerogatives of God. For example, he's spoken of as being eternal in Hebrews 9 and verse 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He is the eternal Spirit. Now, just to make a distinction in relationship to man and the Spirit, in this case, and God, God is eternal in, it, in the absolute sense. There never has been time with God. There, there's no beginning, no ending with God. While man has a spirit placed within him, there was a time we did not exist. And then we came into existence. The spirit of man will continue to live throughout eternity. But we are not eternal in the same sense that God is, because we have a beginning. God did not. And thus, when it speaks of the eternal spirit, it's showing that eternal nature that there is no beginning, no ending with him. He is eternal in his trait, his uh, nature. He's also omniscient. When we get to these omni comments, uh, the word omni means simply all. And then when we talk about omniscience, uh, the latter part of that is, comes from the word science. The uh, word science literally means knowledge. And so when we're talking about omniscience, we're talking about someone who is all-knowing. Well, in 1 Corinthians 2, in verse 10 and 11, he mentions that God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So here is the Spirit searcheth all things. Well, even, he says, the deep things of God those things that man cannot know because man is a finite being and man cannot know the mind of God except through revelation that God gives. 
Well, here's the Spirit, though, who knows all things, even those deep things of God. That's showing the Spirit is God, but it also shows His omniscience, because He searcheth all things. He's also omnipotent. In Micah 3 and verse 8, and when we're talking about omnipotent, we're talking about all-powerful. Micah 3 and verse 8 says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. Now you might notice, if you're looking at the King James, I don't, didn't look at the other translations that the Spirit is lowercase there. The King James translators did not believe that this is referring to the Holy Spirit, that third person of the Godhead. But I believe that if you look at it, it is. It is the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Jehovah that he's dealing with, or the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, truly, I am full of power because of that Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is able to give him power. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord has all power. In Romans 15 and verse 19, Paul would state, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto our Lyricum, I have pre fully preached the gospel of Christ by the power of the Spirit of God. By the way, isn't that basically what uh, Michael 3 and, 8, ver 3 and verse 8 was saying? Full of power by the Spirit of the Lord? Well, here, I'm doing these signs and wonders, these miracles, by the power of the Spirit of God. The signs and wonders dealing with miracles, mighty signs and wonders, mighty miraculous powers. In other words, he had the power to perform these miracles. Why? Because of the power of the Spirit. Thus, the Spirit is one who is all-powerful, omnipotent. But also, he's omnipresent. He's present everywhere. In the 139th Psalm, and in verse 7, the psalmist is talking about well, how God knows him, and that how God is everywhere. And he asks the question, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? Well, he's dealing with the nature of God and the fact that God is everywhere. Where can I flee from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence? Because the spirit is everywhere. He is omnipresent. A nature of, again, God. We, of course, are both limited in our knowledge. We're limited in our power. We're limited in our presence as to where we <clears throat> physically are, but the Spirit is not limited in any of these aspects. And thus, those traits, omni-traits as they're sometimes called, are possessed by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. But also, it mentions the fact that the Spirit is truth. When Jesus is speaking to his apostles, preparing them for his departure, John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus uses the phrase, the Spirit of truth, three times to refer to the Holy Spirit. The first time in John the 14th chapter and verse 17, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth, <coughs> it seeth him not, Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Here's the spirit of truth. Well, God is a God of truth. That's one of his 
attributes, his characteristics. And now then, Jesus is identifying the Spirit as the Spirit of truth because that is his attribute. In John 15 and verse 26, he again states that the Comforter, or when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And so here he identifies him both as a comforter, and that is a very interesting word in itself. Uh, Sometimes uh, maybe go into a study of that. But he's the comforter. And he says he is the spirit of truth. He's going to be sent from the Father to you, to the apostles. But he is that has that nature of truth. And then again in chapter 16, he mentions it in verse 13. When he says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, That shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. By the way, notice the personal pronoun continually being used, he, not it. The Spirit is not a thing, and yet some denominational groups would force it to be, or force him to be an it, that he is simply a thing, he is a force, or sometimes a breath, a wind, and that's all that he is. But if that be the case, would not be using he all through this. Jesus would not have been. It would have been an it, a neuter type of a comment. But here, here the spirit, he, the spirit of truth is going to come into them and the spirit of truth would be able to guide them into all truth. But he is the spirit of truth. Then in 1 John, the fifth chapter, in verse 6, <clears throat> it states that he, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, <coughs> not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And so here again, he identifies the Holy Spirit as being truth. Now then, just to make this uh, contrast, Jesus tells the Jews of his day that were rejecting him in John the 8th chapter and verse 44, the year of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. You see, here is Satan. He's a liar. That's his nature. That's his characteristic of being a liar. As opposed to, here's God. He is truth. God is a God of truth. What is the Spirit? The Spirit is over here and has that characteristic, that trait of truth, not the characteristic of the devil, which is that of lying. And so if the spirit was a telling lies, or could lie, he could not be considered as truth, the spirit of truth. But he also does the work of God. Not only does he have those characteristics that belong to God, he does the work of God. He had a part in creation. In Genesis, as we begin the scriptures, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But then notice verse 2 and verse 3. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Uh, I'm told that the Hebrew here basically says, instead of as we have it, let there be light, and there was light, light is, light was. He just calling it light. And that's what happened. How did it happen? Well, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth. The Spirit of God was 
an, that a, an active part in that creation process from the very beginning. Job mentions in chapter 26 and verse 13 that by his spirit, he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. So here's God in that creation process, but he mentions by his spirit he's done these things. And thus, here's the creative process, and the spirit is involved in that creative process. Now then, when we're looking at creation, by the way, while man, we many times use the word create in relationship to what man does, there's a vast difference, though. Because in creation, Genesis 1, and the references to that, there is a creation out of nothingness. Nothing was there, and because of God and his creative work, and now then we see the spirit and Spirit's involvement in that creative process, out of nothingness, something existed. Something came into being. Man cannot create something like that. Man can take something that exists and mold it and make it or fashion it to where he creates something, but he's creating something out of something else. Man doesn't have the power to take nothing and to create something. There's the song that was sung, uh, out of nothing you get nothing. Well, that's true. If there is nothing, you're going to end up with nothing. That's the problem with evolution, by the way. Evolution basically says you have nothing at some point in time, and out of that nothing, there's a great explosion. What exploded if there's nothingness? But out of something, out of nothing, you had a great explosion. And this explosion, by the way, it doesn't just simply go out. It starts revolving, going around in circles. I hmm. wonder what caused that. And then... All of these things start evolving, well, out of nothing, you still have nothing. God takes nothing and is able to create this world. The Spirit was involved directly in that creative process. But also... The Spirit has a work in revelation. Now, we'll come back to this and discuss it more, but <coughs> suffice it to say at this time, and let's look at two passages, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10. And we mentioned uh, verses 11 and 12 just a moment ago, but here God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Here is the Spirit searching the mind of God and revealing the mind of God to us. We would not know. And this goes to back, back to verse 9. We would not know by our own knowledge and our own wisdom those deep things of God. There's no way for us to know the mind of God other than the Spirit's work in revealing that mind of God to us. Even the Old Testament is spoken of in the same way in Second Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, Peter says, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Literally, that word moved is a word that means carried along. The Spirit was carrying along those men of the Old Testament as they spoke and as they wrote in revealing God's will to the people at that time. 
And when it says that no scripture is of any private interpretation, that literally is that no scripture is of one's own. You don't have it your right to your own views, your own interpretation, your own meaning. Why? Because God is revealing his, uh, himself through the Spirit. The Spirit is carrying them along in revealing that mind of God to people. And so they didn't have the right to change it and alter it. Why? Because they were being carried along by the Spirit. The Spirit worked in revealing God to man. But also... The Spirit works in the affairs of man. First, in overruling natural law. Now, when we're talking about overruling natural law, we're talking about now performing miracles. In Hebrews 2 and verse 4, it says, God also bearing witness... I know the King James has bearing them witness because of the context, but it's literally God is bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and divers and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So here's these miracles that are being done. They are for, verse 3, confirmation process. God is bearing witness that this that is being spoken of, first by the Lord and then by his apostles, that it was true, that it was right. How? By the miracles that were being performed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was working these miracles through these men to confirm these men as being of God and that their message was from God. And so here's the Holy Spirit overruling natural law. Now, when we're talking about miracles, we're talking about Bible miracles. We're not talking about the loose way in which the term miracle is used in our society today. Because if you hear people talk today, just about anything and everything is a miracle. Um, and that's not a Bible miracle. But that's also why these fake healers can fool so many people. They talk about all these miracles. Miracles happen every day. Well, no, they don't. They don't happen now. Age of miracles ended. That's another lesson. But, but the Spirit was working miracles. He was overruling natural law. In 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, actually chapters 12, 13, and 14 are dealing, is dealing with uh, miracles. Paul is correcting some of the errors of the Corinthian church regarding miracles. And he declares at the first part of chapter 12 that the Spirit gives various miraculous gifts to men. Now, starting in verse 4 and going through verse 11, he writes, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But <coughs> the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. By the way, in the last statement there, dividing to every man severally as he will, he's talking about the Spirit doing this. But there's volition. The Spirit has, does this according to his will. 
He gives one, something to one, something else to someone else. That's a decision of will, of mind, of volition, which is one of those personal traits we talked about. But here, Paul lists nine spiritual gifts. These spiritual gifts, each and every one of them, is miraculous in nature. Um, sometimes we have, we'll face difficulties in dealing with other individuals, showing that, well, it talks about faith. You mean faith that doesn't exist anymore? Well, not miraculous faith. It does not. Does faith? Yes. But it's non-miraculous in nature. This is a miraculous faith. The faith that could say to a mountain, mountain be removed and it be removed from the world. That's the type of faith that he's dealing with. It is a miraculous faith. Um, the diver's kinds of tongues. Well, tongue is simply a language of man. You mean we can't speak anymore? Well, this is miraculous languages. In other words, an individual is able to speak a language that they've never spoken before. They've never studied, they've never learned it, but they're able to speak it. I doubt that any of you know Swahili. If you know that, raise your hand. I don't see any hands going up. If you were able right now to start speaking Swahili, that would be a miracle. A language of man that you've never studied and all of a sudden able to speak. That's the diver's kinds of tongues that he's talking about. It is miraculous in nature. All of these that he lists here, these nine different spiritual gifts, are dealing with miracles. But these miraculous powers are given by the Spirit. That's the point. He is able to override nature, performing miracles to work in the affairs of man. Uh, by the way, in relationship to the tongues, the languages, you see that in Acts, the second chapter. The apostles performed a miracle, how? By speaking in the languages of different people. And some people want to make the miracle on the hearers. It's not the hearers, it's the speakers. The apostles are the ones who perform the miracle of being able to speak in languages. And thus, people wonder, how can we hear in our own language? Because, God, uh, because the Spirit was overriding natural law, languages they had never learned, never studied, did not speak, and now then they were able to speak those. How? Because of the Spirit. Performing a miracle and working in the affairs of man. But also... That's the miraculous in the area of providence. It is the controlling and the use of the laws of nature. That's the difference as to miracle is overriding those laws, whereas providence is the use of those laws. In the 104th Psalm, in verse 30 in particular, it's, dis <coughs> it's discussing what God does for the beast, the animals. And it says, Thou sendest them forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. In other words, God is providing for these animals. The spirit is working in that area of providence in carrying out the providing, and by the way, providence comes from that word provide. God is providing for the animals by the Spirit. The Spirit is doing this 
in that area of providence. Some people, because we deny the miraculous today, say, well, why pray? Because God will, through providential means, accomplish His purpose. And we don't have the time this afternoon to go into study of that, but study the life of Joseph. Great illustration of providence. That here's these dreams that he saw, that he revealed to his brothers. His brothers get angry, sell, sell him into slavery. At the end, his brothers are asking, please forgive us, don't hold it against us. And he's saying, no, God sent me here beforehand because God knew what was going to happen and he was providing for us. That's providence. One miracle but God providing for his children. Well, the Spirit has a part in that providence and thus working in the affairs of man through providential means. But the Spirit also has a part in not only the affairs of man, but in salvation or in regeneration. The salvation of man from sin resides in God. In Ephesians 2 and verse 8, for the, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God. God is the one who has been offended. God is the one who provides salvation. He is the one who can forgive man. I can't come along and say, well, I'm going to forgive myself. Or I can't uh, tell you, well, you're forgiven. When it is God who is the one who is offended. God is the one who forgives. And so salvation resides in God. It does not reside in man. Jesus certainly played a vital role in that salvation process. The Father being that offended one, desiring man's salvation, sends his only begotten Son to this world. And thus Christ comes to this world. He lives that sinless life and then dies upon the cross for our sins. And so here is the Father's part in sending the Son, the Son's vital role in dying upon the cross so that we can be saved. But the Spirit is involved as well. In fact, that's what Jesus taught in relationship to the new birth process. In John, the third chapter, <coughs> verse 3, or verse 5, <coughs> Jesus says to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, or born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, not to go into great detail, but being born of water deals with baptism in water. Baptism is the only thing really in the Scriptures that involves water in, re in regards to salvation. So, that's dealing with baptism. But now then, he also says, must be born of the Spirit. What? Well, when we're dealing with being born of the Spirit, that is the Spirit's instructions as to what we must do in order to be saved. We are begotten again, James writes in chapter 1 and verse 18, by the Word we have been begotten. It is through that Word of God, what is that? That's that Word that the Spirit has revealed and through that, we are born again. Read and study also uh, 1, Peter 2, or 2, 1 Peter 1, verse 22 and 23. That we have purified our souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, 
but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. What is it? We're born again. It is a new birth process. It involves water, water baptism. It also involves the Spirit. What's the Spirit doing? It is revealing that mind of God to the apostles, they speaking those words by which we're going to be saved wrote them down for us, and so through that word of God, we are born again. But the Spirit was having a vital role in that redemption process in revealing the word of God to us. Again, Titus, the third chapter, in verse 5, that not of works of righteousness which we have done, But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Here's that salvation process again. It's not by works that we do, that we determine this is how I'm going to save myself. Or I'm going to do certain so much good that it's going to override any sin within my life and thus I'm going to be saved by my own works. No, not by works of righteousness which we do, but it's God, according to God's mercy. God, in <clears throat> having that desire to save man, sends his son to die upon the cross. And so according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration, that is the washing of the new birth. What is that washing of the new birth? That's that water baptism. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That is making new. The Holy Spirit making us new. How does he do that? That's by the Word of God. The Spirit revealing that message by which it produces faith within our hearts whereby we repent of our sins, we make that confession of Jesus Christ as God's Son, we're baptized in water, we have now new life. We are a new creation. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new, St. Corinthians 5 and verse 17. That's the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Then also, He is involved in the resurrection. The Spirit is involved in the resurrection. Romans 8 and verse 11, Paul says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, (coughs) He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Here's that Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. There's the resurrection. And the Spirit played a part in that resurrection of Jesus Christ and will in our resurrection our, as our mortal body shall be raised and we will be given an incorruptible and immortal body as we see in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 and following, by the Spirit, the Spirit involved in that resurrection. But also, the Spirit's name is used with God. Two times in which we see this very succinctly. First, at the baptism of Jesus, as recorded in Matthew, the third chapter. That when Jesus says, verse 16 and 17, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he sought the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lying upon him. And and a low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So here you have the baptism of Jesus. There is that second person of the Godhead. You have the voice out of heaven which says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There's the first person of the Godhead. But then you also have the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and lighting upon him. There's the third person of the Godhead, the Spirit's name in association with both the Father and the Son. And you see that again in the 28th chapter of Matthew, and verse 19 in that great commission, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and and of the Holy Ghost. The definite article 
and it is translated accurately in the King James, appears before each one, Father, Son, and Spirit. It is baptizing them literally into, and not simply in, into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Using the definite article in that way shows that there are three distinct persons being discussed. Some want to come along and say that God is only one being and he's manifesting himself in different ways. He manifests himself as the Father or he manifests himself in the Son, as the Son or he manifests himself as the Spirit. But it's one being. It would be much like saying, I am a son. At times I exhibited that nature of being a son. At times I'm a husband. I am a father. And so even though it's one being, me, I am exhibiting myself in those different ways. That's the argument that they set forth. But the use of the definite article, the father, the son, the Holy Ghost, shows that it is three separate and distinct beings that are under consideration, not one person manifesting himself in three ways. But also the phrase, into the name of these three, shows that we have a relationship into which we are baptized. We are baptized into a relationship with the Father. We are baptized into a relationship with the Son. We are baptized into a relationship with the Spirit. It would be inconsistent for Jesus to affirm that we are baptized into a relationship with the Father We're baptized into a relationship with the Son and into a relationship with the Spirit if all three of them do not possess the same nature. It would be inconsistent to say that the Father is God, that the Son is God, but then the Holy Spirit is not God. The very fact that Jesus uses these three beings together in this way shows that the Spirit is God. Then one other passage in the lesson will be yours, and that's in in Acts, the fifth chapter. Here you have Ananias who is lying to God, holding back part of the price of the land and lying about it. And Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan failed thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? In verse 3 and to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Thou hast, why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so he says first in verse 3, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, he says you've not lied to men, but unto God. He is setting the Spirit as one who is God. And so as we consider who the Spirit is, we see that He is a person, but that He is also God. Now next week I'll be gone, but the following week we'll get into the Spirit's work. But it is important before realizing the Spirit's work to realize who He is. He's not just simply a force or breath, or anything like that. He is a divine being, a person, if you will, who is, yes, God, and needs to be respected as such. But he has revealed that will of the Father to us in that redemption process to tell us what we must do to be saved. Now, if you've failed to do that within your life, we would encourage you to obey that gospel this afternoon. If you've obeyed that gospel, but you haven't lived according to the Spirit's Word as a child of God, 
and you've transgressed that word of God instead of living faithful to it. And why not repent of your sins, come back into God, and then make things right with Him so that you can have that salvation that is God's gift for us if we will but simply be obedient to the Spirit's revealed will. If you need to come, then we encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.